take this as a yes because I cannot see you anymore. Um, so also from my side, a very uh, warm welcome to this to this virtual workshop. It's indeed great that so many of you took the time uh, to join us this, this afternoon or morning or, or late evening, depending on where you are. Um, before we, we jump into the science of life, um, I would first like to thank uh, the life team so far for all the work and effort that they put into, into this project so far. And I put here some names um, uh, who really contributed to, to, the, to the stuff I'm going to show you uh, specifically. Um, I thought that before we start talking about the science, it would be useful for, um, for most of you um, to understand a little bit uh, the, uh, the general um, status of, of the project and how everything came together. And uh, so I would like to spend a few slides, actually two, two or three slides on, on how, uh, what the Life Initiative actually is and where we are uh, right now. So officially Life was sort of kicked off in 2018 um, and the goal was really to develop the science, the technology and a roadmap for this ambitious uh, space mission uh, that has the goal of directly detecting and characterizing dozens of temperate terrestrial exoplanets. And it's really about direct detection, so it's not a transit um, mission. And so this is very important because sometimes we get this question. And it's very important to emphasize that this is a mid-infrared mission. So we are really aiming at detecting the planet's thermal emissions. So it's not, not in a reflected light. So this is the grand goal of this, this whole initiative. Why do we do this? Because we are really convinced about the great scientific potential of such a mission. And uh, I hope I can convince you um, of this uh, in the coming uh, 20 or 25 minutes or so. And actually none of the currently planned missions or concepts or projects that are on ground or in space, they will provide comparable data. So it's really something that is, that is quite unique and um, uh, quite compelling as I, as I already said. So the overall context for this initiative, I think most of you are well aware that uh, on, in the, on the US side, uh, the NASA decadal survey is still ongoing. So they're trying to figure out what the next flagship mission could be. And exoplanet characterization is featured prominently in this, in this decadal with LUVAR and HABEX and also the Origin Space Telescope uh, having a big chunk of exoplanet science in, in, in their science cases. So this is important to keep in mind on, on the one hand. In particular, because now the um, Habex and Lupo are searching for reflected light of exoplanets, and Origin is a, is a transit, uh, would, would detect the transit signals of terrestrial exoplanets, in particular around M stars. On the European side, and I'm not sure whether most of you are aware of this, we're, we're going through a, a similar process in, in, in a way. So ESA is also trying to define the scientific landscape, let's say, for the time between 2030 and, and 2050, and it's called the ESA Wide 2050 process. So Isa would really like to understand what will the, the science themes will be for the next L-class or the, the big missions. And uh, so we, we submitted a white paper um, uh, in the middle of last, uh, last year and we were invited to present the science of life at a workshop. And we're still, uh, Isa is still thinking about this. They have several committees so looking at the different concepts. And we hope that towards uh, later this summer, there will be a recommendation what sort of science uh, should be investigated in some more detail in this uh, YH 2050 process. And our hope is, of course, that maybe exoplanets will be featured there, and then maybe a mission like LIFE could actually play a big role. And this is sort of what we, what we, what we have in mind and what we're trying to push for. Um, we should also keep in mind, and this is a little bit a uh, heads up to, to, the, to the younger people uh, today here, that there's, of course, significant heritage from earlier studies. So the kind of mission concept that we have in mind that did exist already uh, 15 to 20 years ago, and it was studied on both sides of the Atlantic Ocean. So on the European side, there was a concept called Darwin, and on the NASA side, there was a concept called TPF, or Terrestrial Planet Finder Interferometer, so I. So there is a lot of heritage that we can build upon. However, significant progress has been made both on the scientific side, as I will show, but also on the technology side ever since. And this is why we think it's really worth revisiting this, this idea and trying to, to, to bring it to reality eventually in the next 20 to 30 years. So the goal for today um, is really to, to get the word out that this initiative here exists and we would like to bring you up to speed where we are and what we do and why we do it. And then certainly trigger also your interest and um, show uh, the, the potential that, that this, this, this mission has. And we would like to invite you to participate uh, if you want and, and if you have time. And as we will see, I think in both talks, in the science talk from me and also in the technical talk from Benny, there's ample um, opportunity to participate. I'm not going to go through all these boxes here. Uh, it's just to show that we have a project structure 
that is split into three uh, main working groups on the science side. Then we have a simulator working group and a technology working group. And each working group uh, has several work packages. Uh, this can be also looked at in, uh, on our web page in, in some more detail. And we are currently trying to, uh, to refill these different boxes with names with people who are willing to contribute here and there. We already have a significant number of people investing some time. And if you, after this, this workshop today, are interested, um, we, we are very happy. You, you would be very welcome to, to join uh, our efforts. And what we are going to do is we're going to reach out to all of you afterwards and ask specifically uh, your permission to be added, that you can add your name to the mailing list and also ask if you're interested in participating in, in our activities. Uh, and I will come back to the science part, at least uh, towards the end of my talk. So I hope now you see a little bit where we are and what the, what the motivation for all of this is. And let me try to add more, more meat to, to, to this by, by showing you some of the, of the signs that we have in mind and that we're convinced that, that the mission like life, like life could do. So um, the way we approach the science at this point in time is really to, to split it up in three main themes or topics. And one is very generic. It means that we'd like to understand the atmospheric diversity of in particular smaller and smallish, smallish planets and to do this in the thermal, uh, thermal light. The second question is related to, to habitability. And uh, I'm well aware that this is sort of a loaded term and different people have different understandings. So we have to be careful about what we mean. The way I interpret it here and will use it in, throughout the talk is uh, a planet that has um, surface conditions that allow liquid water to exist on its surface. And the question related to this point is really how many, uh, what, what fraction of planets that are sort of in an interesting mass size and, and uh, separation regime actually provides these, these kind of conditions. And we think this is an important um, uh, middle step between the generic question of atmospheric diversity on the one hand, and then uh, number three here, the question of biosignatures and trying to identify potentially um, life bearing, bearing planets. And this is, as I said, num number three and in, in investigating the, the existence of biosignatures in, in, some of, in some of these planets. So in order to address these questions, I think most of you are well aware that spectroscopy is, is really key and um, upcoming uh, mid-infrared characterization missions, they will focus mostly on hot and warm transiting exo exoplanets. So uh, you have, we have the, the James Webb Space Telescope hopefully flying very soon, who will do transit and secondary eclipse spectroscopy for some smallish planets. Um, we have then uh, the Argent Space Telescope, which is currently under consideration in the decadal. So we will see whether this, this, this will happen. But we will for sure have the aerial mission on the European side, which is a dedicated uh, atmospheric characterization observatory um, launching uh, to, in, towards the end of, of this decade, hopefully. Um, and I put it out here a quote from the, from the aerial uh, yellow book, uh, where it says that um, in the long run, um, the, the, the goal is certainly to characterize uh, the whole range of exoplanets, in, in, in particular also potentially habitable ones. And at the moment, Ariel is probably seen as sort of a, a pathfinder for future and even more, more ambitious campaigns. And we see life as a more ambitious campaign exactly in this context, that we can learn from all of these missions already quite a lot, but there's still parameter space that none of these missions will, will, will be able to cover. So we have to do, to do something else. And in particular, we have to go away from transit missions uh, simply because uh, the sample that we can study uh, will always be too small, at least with the current concepts that are, that, that are listed here, for instance, because of the uh, limited probability of transits occurring uh, around, around nearby stars. So this means that the next step is probably a direct detection and a direct uh, spectroscopy mission. And you can do this now in two ways. And I already indicated this. You could do this in a reflected light in the UV, optical, and infrared wavelength, or you could do this in the thermal emission, the mid-infrared, and um, I already mentioned Lubar and Hebex, so on the, for the reflected light, there are very um, sophisticated uh, concepts and studies uh, have been done in, on, on the American side that lead to these uh, really, uh, I, I must say, impressive uh, final reports for these two, two mission concepts. And we sort of, we, the LIFE initiative is sort of on the other side. And one question, uh, I want to mention this uh, already right now, uh, is of course, um, it would be very interesting to understand what the synergies uh, could be for, for these two kind of mission concepts. So just imagine that we would have both. You know, on the one hand, you would have a reflected light mission. 
something like UBAR or HabEx. And on the other hand, we would have the thermal emission um, for, for an extraterrestrial planet. What sort of additional information could we gain? Um, and I think this is something that is certainly uh, still, there is certainly more work to be done in, in this direction. And for the time being, uh, uh, we sort of assume that life is a self-standing uh, mission. So uh, the planet it's going to characterize also need to be uh, found first. And so in this regard, we're sort of similar to, to uh, the, the concept studies for Luber and Habex, where this was also a similar, similar assumptions. So let me go now through these uh, different uh, three different themes, the, the diversity aspect, the habitability aspect, and the search for, for biosignatures. And for the, for the diversity, it's very important to understand what sort of planets, how many planets, and what kind of planets life could actually detect. And we do this uh, with the help of Monte Carlo simulations. And some of you who may have followed some of the publications related to life already, they knew how we, how we do this. So we take the statistics from the, uh, from the Kepler mission and we, uh, we simulate uh, planetary systems around nearby stars within, within 20 parsecs. And then we ask the question, giving some, um, some instrument parameters and giving some additional noise sources, how many planets would a life actually be able to detect? And what I'm showing here now is, is an update of some previous um, publications uh, or previous results that we have. And still I have to put here a work in progress sticker because we're really uh, literally at this very moment um, updating these, these numbers again. We have a new stellar catalog. We also included now additional targets. Um, and uh, we also changed the way we distribute the observing time uh, uh, around different stars. These, these are details and we don't have to worry about them uh, right now too much, but this is just to, to, to let you know that in case you see some and remember some figures right now, that they are gonna, they're gonna change again in the coming two, two or three weeks um, towards the, the publication. So I'm going to show you now a, a plot um, with planets that are detected with a signal to noise of at least 10 during a two and a half year search phase. So the assumption is, that life will search planets first, and then we'll pick a subset during a second characterization phase that it will investigate uh, in, in some more detail. And I do this by showing, by showing uh, on the, on the y-axis the radius of the planet going from half of, uh, Earth radius up to six Earth radii. And on the, on the um, x-axis, you, you see the, the stellar insulation in solar, in solar constants. And each box now contains the average number of planets that we obtain from our Monte Carlo simulations by redoing the survey, by recreating uh, multiple universes. And I think in this case, we did 500 runs through our, our stellar sample. So these numbers are a little bit hard to read. So let me, let me help you a little bit. Uh, so I put here the, the, the sum on the, on the right-hand side. So you expect um, roughly, uh, let's say 150-ish, uh, planets between uh, half uh, Earth radius and 1.5 Earth radii, uh, 230, uh, let's say, in the mini Neptune regime, and then 60 in, in, in the Neptune regime. And we sort of limited the, the, the study to these, to these radii for the time being. Um, uh, but of course, there could also be giant planets to, to be detected. And this actually was one of the reasons when we did the first kind of simulations in this direction, these numbers that did not really change, change very much. Uh, but it's very important that right now the simulations they really uh, include all astrophysical noise sources you, you could imagine for an interferometer and then in his talk will discuss a little bit more in detail how the measuring technique actually works but for those of you who are interested in, in what goes into the simulation so this really includes the emission from the local zodiacal dust it includes exosody uh, dust disks that we, uh, where we took the results from the host survey of the LBTI. So we also sampled there randomly. We put exosody disks around the distance, uh, distant uh, stars. And we also take into account stellar leakage. Uh, so we really have basically all major astrophysical noise sources included in the simulations right now. And we assume in this case, our baseline is uh, four telescopes with roughly two meter uh, uh, aperture. Um, the instrument um, noise terms, they're still currently being included in the simulator. The hope is that, of course, we're limited by the astrophysical noise and not by the instrument noise. And this is why I think these numbers are, are sort of uh, representative. They will change a little bit, as I said, but hopefully not too much. Um, and if they do, they should, they should go up because we, we are increasing the, we, we having better, a smarter way now of distributing the observing time. I want to highlight one box down here, and this is uh, the, the box uh, with uh, planets that have radii between 0.5 and 1.5 Earth radii and receiving a, a flux between 0.35 and 1.75 uh, times the solar, the solar constant. Because this is sort of the, 
the, the, the regime where you can't expect um, you know, habitable planets to, to, to lie. And uh, the numbers that we get here is uh, from this simulation that we get 26 with a signal to noise of 10, and we get 46 with a signal to noise of 5. And I think these are very important numbers um, to, to keep in mind uh, how many planets we will get even uh, during the search phase for further, for further characterization. And I will argue in a few minutes why we think uh, 30 to 50 is a good number to aim for in this uh, part of the, of the parameter space. So keep in mind uh, that between, let's say, 30 and 50, this seems to be really within reach during the search phase uh, for, 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 for the mission. So all of this uh, is really now done with a new simulator tool that we're, uh, we're working on right now that can create mock observations. Uh, so real mock observations where we take the geometry of the interferometer in account, where we take the different noise sources into account, as I already said, and where we uh, currently are also taking, uh, working on including instrumental, instrumental noise. And here's one, one simulation uh, that, that shows you how a planet is really detected. This is a high signal to noise example. It's a planet that has 1.5 Earth radii, 10 parsec, uh, roughly 300 Kelvin temperature. And uh, the, the on-source integration time is, is relatively long. But this shows you that uh, this is how the signal that can, we can extract actually looks like. And you may wonder what is the, the, the signal uh, on, on the other side. This has to do with the way uh, the measurement works. And, and then he will talk about the, the, the creation of this transmission maps uh, during, during his talk. So we always have this, at least in the current way, uh, we, we think the architecture should look like. You always have this, uh, this uh, sort of pattern with a plan on the one side. And then uh, exactly on the other side, you have these, these other wings. With this, we can actually extract uh, spectral information because we assume that we will operate roughly between three and 20 microns. Uh, the exact reference range is still to be determined, but you get a spectrum and you can hear, this is, this is uh, now an example, how uh, the input spectrum, which was a black body, is retrieved uh, from, these, from these stimulations. And this helps us to understand how well we can uh, constrain uh, exoplanet uh, parameters already during the search phase. And in particular, uh, this relates to the, to the radius of the planet and to the temperature of the planet, which is uh, just the, the luminosity of, of, of the object, obviously. Uh, but it helps us to understand how well we can do this in the first round of observations, because this is important to understand how we prioritize um, uh, planets for uh, a second visit or even a third visit or for some in-depth follow-up observations. And I will come back to this point um, uh, later on. This is to demonstrate that we can also extract signals from multiple uh, planetary, uh, multiple plant systems. So you have three planets here uh, on the left-hand side. Uh, it's the brightest object with has a signal noise in excess of, of 16. Um, then in the middle one, uh, in the middle panel, you have um, a sort of intermediate case. And on the right-hand side, you have a plant that is detectable with an SNR of five. And they were all simulated uh, with, this, with this live sim tool. And we extract one signal uh, after the other. Uh, just to learn how well we can then constrain uh, planetary properties. And this is uh, again shown here with, the, with the, what kind of plants were simulated. These are now plants with one Earth radius, 10 parsec, and a certain uh, different separations. Uh, we have exozoti disks included, and this corresponds roughly to 35 hours uh, on, on source time. And now if you ask the question what we can learn from the direct spectra, um, we took here as an example the weakest signal uh, from, these, from these three planets. And we asked the question, how well can we constrain the radius of the planet? How well can we constrain uh, the temperature of the planet and also its position? And all three plants are plotted here. Uh, the three plants I just showed, uh, temperature on the x-axis and the radius on the, on, on the, uh, on the y-axis, with the arrow ellipsis, uh, the true values uh, being the, the crosses, and the derived uh, expected value is the, uh, the dots. And that does just focus on the, 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 um, the weakest signal, which is the green curve. So we get the radius uh, to plus minus 0.3 Earth radii. We get the temperature to plus minus 50 uh, Kelvin. And we get the astromatic uh, position to plus minus 0.02 AU and the, the position angle to plus minus uh, 0.3 degree. And we are now doing this for the whole survey sample to really build up statistics how well we can from a single epoch observations already determine these kind of fundamental properties. And um, I'm very optimistic that these numbers are really very promising in the sense that we can really nail down a radius, temperature, and also the position very well with a single visit. And this is certainly one of the big uh, advantages of looking at the thermal emission 
that in particular radius and temperature are much better constrained than, for instance, in, in, in reflected light. So coming back now to the question of, of um, uh, habitable planets, um, I already mentioned the number of 30 to, to, to 50 planets that we would like to, to, under, to investigate in, in some more detail in the specific uh, uh, range of parameter space between 0.5 and 1.5 Earth radii and between uh, flux ranges of 0.35 to 1.75 times this, the, the solar constant. And um, it's whenever you find a planet and you can claim it's habitable or even find biosignatures, of course, you're golden. You can say, well, this is, this is amazing and we can do all the great studies. So we try to turn the question around and we want to make sure that in the case that we don't find anything that is super spectacular, we still want to learn something that is fundamentally important scientifically. So we basically ask the question, how many planets do we need to observe? in order that the null result of finding that nothing is really interesting, quotes on quotes, is a meaningful result. So the, hypothet the hypothesis we, we put forward here is the following. We, asked, we assume that 50% of planets that are in this part of the parameter uh, range, with, this, uh, with the radius in this, in this range that I just mentioned, and lying at a separation from the star, that, uh, so that the incoming flux is in, is in this uh, range of, of incoming uh, radiance, so we, we assume, let's assume that 50% of the planets, they do provide uh, conditions for liquid water. And then the question is, if you now observe a number of planets, how constraining is the null result so that none of the planets we see do actually show these kind of conditions so that we can rule out this hypothesis. And below here in the plot, we show the confidence with, uh, how, with how, how well we can actually re reject this, this hypothesis as a function of the number of planets. So if you, object, if you observe two plan, uh, 10 planets, I'm sorry, 10 planets in this uh, part of parameter space, and none of them is, uh, has conditions for liquid water, then it's not really constraining yet. But as you increase the number of planets you characterize, the stronger and stronger, obviously, the null result becomes. And we can now have a statistical framework here to really help us find out what is a good number of planets to aim for in order to make sure that in case no planet turns out to be, uh, turns out to have conditions for liquid water, that this is, this is scientifically important. So this is the case now for the assumption that 50% that of the planets provide liquid water on the surface. And now you can play around with this hypothesis and you can say what happens if only 20% uh, provide the conditions for liquid water and so on. You can, of course, play and pick whatever number you favor. Um, so if you have 20%, of course, um, then the, the constraining power goes down. Or in other words, you need to find more planets and investigate more planets for this um, uh, non result still being constraining. And we, we, we went back and forth between the 50 and the 20% case. And then we settled that uh, here, this number, 30 to 50, this is roughly the, a good number to, to aim for. Uh, to make sure that we reach a mission concept that gives us at least these kind of, uh, this kind of number of planets, because then we have this, this constraining power, even for the case that even if only 20% of the planets um, that are in this part of parameter space provide these uh, provide conditions for, for, for liquid water. So this is why I emphasize this number of 30 to 50 to begin with, and this is part of an ongoing study. Is this the right number? Is this the right question? And this is certainly something that we're going to look at in the future in, in some more detail as well. Maybe there's other good reasons to aim for this number. Maybe there's other good reasons to aim for higher or lower numbers. And this is part of the ongoing work in the, in the science team. Let me come to the, to the uh, final part uh, related to, uh, to biosignatures and to atmospheric characterization in some, more, in, in some more detail. So what we are currently working on is we would really like to understand uh, what is the spectral resolution, the wavelength range, and also the SNR that is required in order to really get a, a good handle on uh, biosignature gases, not only detecting them, but only having a good handle on the, on the quantitative abundances. And uh, there have been a, a number of studies in the past that, this, that, that did this um, with examples where a planet was picked and then it uh, was a, a certain a signal to noise and a certain spectral resolution and wavelength range was assumed. And then you got an answer how well you can constrain um, the, the, the abundances of the different uh, molecules in the atmosphere. We would like to turn this a little bit around and would really like to derive um, scientific requirements for the, for, for, the, for the mission by doing a grid of uh, different spectral resolutions, wavelength ranges, and SNRs 
to really uh, inform the, the technical team that we need an SNR of let's say 55 at least because then we can detect certain features with a certain confidence and we need to have a spectral range uh, from tw uh, 3 to 20 microns or maybe 6 to 20 microns is good enough or maybe 17 is good enough for the long wavelength cutoff. These are the questions that we're trying, uh, currently trying to, to, uh, to work on using um, an atmospheric retrieval study and here are some examples for, for, for spectra that we just started creating. The focus will be an Earth twin. And uh, of course, we can argue whether this is a good starting point. Uh, of course, we will not expect an Earth twin to really exist. But the argument that we would bring forward is if you're not able to characterize an Earth twin well, then probably we have a problem with the mission to, to begin with. So using that as a starting point is good. And then we will make cross checks using other planetary uh, atmospheres to, to be sure that we're not missing uh, out on anything important. The spectra here, just for, for uh, just some examples that, uh, to test our, our current code, uh, we reproduce the Earth atmosphere with different um, levels of, of water, we reproduce the Mars atmosphere, and we're trying to put all this together now in a, in a Bayesian framework to do, to do the retrieval uh, analysis. The first kind of this analysis we did already last, last year, and it was part of the white paper we submitted to, to ESA. And this was like one, one, uh, one part of this, this grid, or one, one portion of the grid I was just, just describing. And uh, this showed us that this is really an important um, analysis to really, to really complete. Um, and what, what we did here is we, we compared the, the information content of um, the emission spectrum of an Earth twin to, uh, to that of the reflected, reflected light spectrum. So this is a little bit of a complicated plot, so let me walk you through this. You see um, uh, down at the bottom of the plot the different, different molecules that we, that we included in the, in the atmosphere of, of the Earth twin. And the black lines, they indicate the true value of the abundance that we put in, in, in the model. Um, and then the, the retrieved uh, red points, or the red points, sorry, they are the retrieved values from our, from our uh, retrieval uh, analysis. So in this case, we simulated the Earth spectrum between 3 and 20 micron. Uh, we assume a signal to noise of, of 20 um, in, in, all the, in all the channels and a spectral resolution of 100, which is probably a little bit on the, on the, um, on the optimistic or on the, on the high side um, uh, compared to, to previous studies. However, you can see that in, this, in such a case, uh, we can really accurately uh, retrieve the true value that, we're, that we put in for a number of very important molecules. And on the, on, the, on, the right, on the right side of the plot, you can even also see how well we can retrieve the radius and the pressure on the ground, uh, uh, on the ground layer of the atmosphere, so at the surface of the planet in this case, and also the ground, the ground temperature. The yellow areas uh, for the molecules, the yellow areas indicate plus minus, uh, plus minus half a dec, so plus minus a factor of three. And the arrow bars on the red points, they are the one sigma arrow bars. So you can see how well we can really constrain the abundances. And for the radius, the, the, the yellow area is plus minus 0.3 um, Earth radii. Uh, for the pressure, it's really, again, half, it's, it's again half a dec, plus minus. And for the temperature, it's plus minus 10 Kelvin. And you can see how well, in this case, we can retrieve uh, all these, these, these properties. And as I said, we, we used that analysis to compare it to the reflected light spectrum. And there was a great paper published by, by Fengadal in 2018, where they investigated uh, basically a reflected light mission similar to, to the LUVAR, where they had a, a, an Earth spectrum between 0.4 and 1, uh, 1 micron, an SNR of 20 and also a relatively high spectral resolution. And they investigated the, the reflected light and did the similar analysis as we did for the thermal emission. And you can see here the results overplotted. So the, the blue points now indicate um, how well the different abundances for the molecules that were accessible in their spectra were retrieved, also the error bars. And you can also see uh, the, the radius and the, and, the, and the pressure. So I would like to highlight a few things here, that there's information that is contained in the thermal emission spectrum that you cannot get access to easily uh, in, in, in reflected light, even with, a, with this, uh, this uh, mission concept that Feng et al. Were, were studying. So this relates to, to bias signatures. For instance, methane is really, really hard to get in reflected light. It seems to be easier to be detected uh, at, at the thermal emission. Um, we also have access to, to N2O, uh, which is really not present in, in the optical on the, in the infrared um, and cannot be digged out. 
And uh, on the right hand side, you can see again those indicators for habitability. What's the radius? What's the ground pressure and the, and the temperature? And also there, as we already as I already indicated, the information you get from thermal emission is, is much more telling than, than for the for the reflected light. So this is one of the reasons why we think that uh, a thermal emission uh, a thermal emission mission is at least complementary uh, to a reflected light mission. And uh, it's now uh, one of the things we, we're going to hopefully work on in the future is to combine the, these two things. So what would, could we actually learn if we were to even combine the, the information from the two? So once we now understand better what, what sort of requirements we have for spectral resolution, sensitivity, and, and, and wavelength range, as I said, we're going to apply this also to other, to other questions. And one of the grids we're going to look at is Earth through time. We would like to understand how well a certain mission concept can also then constrain different atmospheres. Um, and we're going to take uh, Earth through time as, as one of these, these, these examples where we're going to apply the, the mission that we, uh, the mission requirements that we have to these kind of, uh, of planets. We're going to use the instrument simulator that we have to create mock observations and use the retrieval framework to understand how well there uh, the atmospheric abundances and properties can be derived. This was the key parts for the exoplanet part of, of, of life. But there's also other, um, other uh, communities and other science questions you can address with such a mission. And I think this is important to, to keep in mind. I would imagine that most of you are really interested in exoplanet science, but let's keep in mind that other communities studying circumstellatists or AGNs or, or star clusters, star formation and evolved stars. So everything that is basically dusty, where mid-infrared is really key and where spatial resolution is really key, they will certainly be interested in such a mission. However, until now, the, our activities was really focused on, on, um, on the exoplanets, not so much yet on these other, on these other um, science topics. So I hope I could convince you now that we're really, this is really great and you can do a lot of fantastic things with, which, uh, with such a mission. And there's lots of opportunities to contribute. And I show here again now part of this, this diagram I showed at the very beginning, now focusing on the, on the exoplanet work, working group. Um, in addition to the three different themes, um, planetary diversity, I was already mentioning, for instance, what are other questions that we should address? What are other parts of parameter space that we should investigate and why? In addition to habitable planets, uh, is 30, 50 the right number? Are there other, qu other questions that we're missing? And in addition to biosignatures, are we missing biosignatures? What about false positives and, and so on? Um, other things that we have to, to worry about. In addition to these, to these three themes where support and, and, and additional manpower, woman power is certainly welcome. Um, there's also uh, the question about, for instance, the target database. So we have uh, people working actively on compiling a very comprehensive database for the stellar targets. We need to get all the stellar properties in there. We need to understand what constraints on planetary systems are already existing. We need to include uh, the information about uh, debris disks and exosody disks. Uh, to have really a comprehensive database that helps us later to understand which uh, targets to prioritize and which to put on the on the primary mission, for instance. Work on other science, I already mentioned, it's not uh, has not uh, been looked at in, in great depth so far, and there's uh, certainly also uh, ways to, to contribute, as is also on the simulator side, uh, if some of you are really interested in, uh, in, in uh, building uh, sophisticated data simulators, there's uh, more, more work to be done. And Denis will talk more about the technology part in, in, in his talk. And with this, I would like to, to end and just to quickly summar, uh, summarize uh, what, what I've been saying in the last 25 minutes. So life is really about a, a mid-infrared nulling interferometer um, and why we need an interferometer, Denis will, will, will justify in a few minutes. And we want to detect the thermal emission of terrestrial exoplanets primarily. The wavelength range would probably, probably be something between 3 and 20 microns. The spectral resolution, probably between 20 and, and 100 microns. And, uh, 100, uh, we will have to, have to see. And this will come up from this retrieval I was mentioning. We would imagine a total mission lifetime of five to six years. Um, the search phase first, and then the characterization phase, and also some time for the, for the other signs. This, of course, depends on how many plants we have to find first. If other missions or other projects, maybe ground-based radio velocity projects will give us a great uh, list of targets already, then the search phase could of course be adapted and we have more time on the characterization. The expected yields, at least with these typical numbers for number of telescopes, uh, size of the primary mirrors um, and so on, 
uh, we really can expect hundreds of exoplanets to be detected. And this is one of the things that, were, that was not clear 15 years ago when ESA and NASA was looking into these concepts uh, for the first time. Back then we had no idea about the exoplanet population out there. So it was really hard to justify or to guess how many planets to, to, to expect. And this is one of the things that now fundamentally changed, uh, I think, the arguments in favor of, of such a mission, because now we can really quantify what we can expect depending on uh, the architecture that, that we're gonna, gonna, pick, gonna pick in the end. And I believe that um, uh, there's really unique scientific potential for the atmospheric characterization because there's so much more information in the thermal emission spectrum than there is in reflected light or in the transit spectrum. And this we should really leverage and, and use as a, as a main argument for, for, uh, for this mission going forward. And with this, I would like to thank for your attention and I'm happy to answer questions.